on this panel is Eugene Beaulieu. He's a professor in the Department of Economics and the Director International Program, School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. Dr. Beaulieu's principal area of research is imperial, empirical international economics with an emphasis on political economy, causes and consequences of international trade policy and economic development. His presentation will put the auto pact into economic history context of Canadian trade policy with a focus on Canada-US trade relations. He will draw a direct connection to the intellectual argument from the auto pact to uh, the Canada-US free trade agreement and the evolution of the economic theory and evidence that built on the auto pact. Thank you. Um, thanks to the organizers. Thanks to Mark and Joe for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here um, and to be part of this. Um, I am an economist, and so it's, uh, it's a slightly different uh, approach I'm going to take today. I'm going to really focus on the economic arguments of the auto pact and, and the economic context of it. Um, I do economic history. I, I, I guess I'm probably more of a dabbler in economic history. Um, but, I, but I have looked at these questions uh, partly because uh, I started working on uh, 19, my first, my thesis was actually on the 1988 uh, election in Canada and I treated it in, in my empirical work there as a referendum on free trade. So of course now that's history, so by uh, de facto I'm an economic historian. Um, I have looked at, I've also looked at the 1911 election and the great trade expansion of the, uh, of the uh, turn of the uh, previous century. Um, just, a, just a quick anecdote before I start, and it's kind of related to what I'm going to talk about, but it is drawing in the economics. And last night and already today, we've talked a lot about how you know, Canada is a small economy, and we have to, uh, we, I mean, we want a rules-based system, and we're, we're negotiating with a big, powerful partner. Um, and so it, it, it kind of reminded me, um, just in terms of thinking about the intellectual history and the economics of this, um, one of my advisors at Columbia was uh, Robert Mundell, and he told me um, that uh, he started working on problems like we're talking about here, although he was more on the financial side, and, he, and his work, what he won the Nobel Prize for, was on small open economies. And at the time, there was a, 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 there was a great, uh, a great uh, uh, opening for him because Americans, the, you know, the profession, the economic profession was American-focused, and they weren't a small open economy. They, they were open, they were a big trading part, uh, country, but as someone pointed out earlier, um, trade was such a small part of their economy. They were so self-sufficient that no, no American economist, it would have occurred to them to, to think about questions of small open economies. Uh, Mundell uh, worked on that and got the Nobel Prize for his work there. So I'm gonna sort of tell a tale today about the auto pack and how it, it came from, uh, or the, the connection to the economic theory and the evolution of the economic theory, which uh, building on the theory and evidence led to uh, you know, the important findings of the McDonald Commission and to the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. Now, of course, uh, you know, the story is more nuanced than that and, and lot, lots going on, but the, the economic, uh, the developments in economics and the contribution of economics I would argue really changed the, the conversation and really pushed this uh, uh, Canada-US free trade agreement uh, over the top, not, not um, maybe at first with the Canadian public, but certainly with policymakers. And if you think back to sort of before, uh, in, in the early 80s or, or in the 70s, um, you know, ca the Canadian policymakers, Canadian, uh, the Canadian po policy establishment was not open to free trade. Um, and, and anything but that. And I think, uh, I do think economists helped convince policymakers, and there was a sea change in policy um, after that. So let me, let me tell you my story. Uh, first of all, um, it was great to be on this panel with Andre and Greg, and I learned a lot from them. I'm glad Greg did the numbers, so I'm not gonna talk too much about numbers. Um, I'm also glad that I saw a couple graphs today, so I can show, I'm gonna actually show you some graphs. And I'm gonna show you uh, what I show my executive MBA classes on sort of a case study of, of monopolistic competition, and, and this is a, a great illustration of that, so you have to bear with me on that. But also with Andre and learning the fine details of this, and, and uh, um, that was really good. So I'm going to touch on some of those aspects of it, but I'm going to focus on the economic part of it. So first of all, um, just a little bit of overlap. The, uh, 
th this is some, uh, some observations on the auto pack. So the auto pack, again, um, just drawing a little bit on, on, the tr on the Trump experience, it was a huge deal. And as we all know, it was a huge deal for Canada. Um, and I'm gonna argue that not just, uh, not just um, for the auto sector, but obviously I think uh, beyond that. So, um, you know, again, we have this uh, policy of exceptionalism, um, and then Canada, um, Canada negotiation, negotiators were very successful, and we got a very good deal. Um, and as, uh, as, um, as Greg pointed out, um, uh, President Johnson said, you, you screwed us on the auto pack. And um, so this is, this, is, uh, this, is a, this is quoted from Michael Hart, but it's just some observations on the auto pack. I'm going to try and go a little bit deeper on some of the economics of this. Um, but another quote I found um, uh, is that the, a watershed agreement um, that transformed the industry, changed the, the direction of Canadian trade policy. So again, I will talk about how it was protectionist, but it evolved into uh, a preferential trade agreement, a, a, a sea change in policy, not just in Canada, but around the world. Again, when we, when we signed the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, um, this, that was a big deal, and that was a game-changing deal. Um, and it altered the face of the Canadian economy, I think, arguably. So um, I said this. This is something I was, when I was looking, um, when I was preparing this, I actually found something that I had written on this. Um, and, uh, and so we have, uh, we have Michael Hart and, and then my own, uh, my own thoughts. So it's, here's a quick little outline. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the auto pact agreement. Uh, Andre went through the details of it. I won't go th through as many details, but again, trying to focus a little bit more on the economics of it. Um, I'm going to show you the textbook example. Um, so I, I, I partly apologize for making you sit through some, some uh, um, um, economics on this, uh, some graphs, but we're going to do that. And then I'm going to link it to the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement and the economic argument for that. Okay, so um, we, we talked, uh, somebody mentioned uh, Donald McDonald, but another, um, I think a great Canadian economist, uh, or two, two, two brothers, but Ron, Ron recently passed away, and um, great Canadian economist that really, really contributed a lot to the economic thought, and, and they wrote so much on these topics and on the auto pack, I learned a lot um, from their writings. And one of the things they pointed out was that the auto industry was, uh, it was an oligopoly. It was, it was a, uh, a few small firms uh, producing um, in the industry. And, but one of the key things was just pointing out that as a small open economy, as a small economy, we didn't have the scale to produce at the, at the, uh, at the level that is necessary to be efficient in this, in this market. So um, it, what the upshot was that we had an inefficient uh, uh, industry compared to the U.S. Consumers paid a lot more, and um, we also had fewer varieties, fewer choice of what autos we could purchase. And um, I, um, I don't have any pictures of, of uh, the inside of my van at the time, but uh, Greg, Greg uh, gladly shared some of that. But we didn't have the choices that we did or that, uh, that the Americans had at the time. So this is a classic um, story of, of scale economies. And, um, and I mean, let's make no mistake about this. This was an industrial policy. As, as Andre said, this was managed trade, but this, this was actually industrial policy. And as a, an economist, I'm a little reluctant to sort of point out how successful it was. I mean, this is infant industry um, protectionism at its best, um, but it's also an illustration of how this can work. And if there's scale economies, um, you know, uh, it's, it's clear that this kind of, this kind of uh, policy can be effective, and it was. So, um, the, I, 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 I kind of highlighted this new trade in the I.O. literature. Really at the time, it was, it was kind of standard textbook economics, the scale economies, the, the impact of that. Um, and, um, but it did evolve from there. But, there were, but the, the theory pointed out that there was potentially very large gains that Canadian producers could have if we, if we uh, somehow expanded our, our production. So here's my graph. Um, this is the basic, this is the standard uh, uh, graph of uh, uh, quantity produced and costs. And, and the more you, this, because there's increasing returns to scale, the more you produce, the, the uh, lower your costs. Um, engineers and, and others at the time calculated that about 600,000 units were required to get to sort of the minimum, uh, get to the uh, point where you wouldn't get further gains from, in, from expanding your production. Um, 
And there was this 300,000 number was a pretty important number. It just said that um, you know you could get tremendous uh, gains from going beyond 300,000. And the largest Canadian producer at the time was producing under 200,000 units. So um, if you think about where where Canada was, we had three producers. Our our total uh, production in the country was just over 300,000. I think it was around 390,000 or something like that. But the largest producer, GM, was, was way, up, way up that average cost curve. It was an expensive uh, proposition. And uh, the, the idea, the economics of this was let's, let's get a bigger market and let's, uh, let's expand and move down that average cost curve. So um, Andre mentioned the Bladen report, but um, this is the kind of thing that was recognized. It was recognized by Wanakot and other economists that wrote about this and, and said, you know, if we can get down that um, average cost curve, we can be competitive. So I'm, I'm going to kind of skip through this a little bit fast, but uh, Andre went through it carefully. Um, you know, we did remove tariffs, um, but one of the points was that this was very much, it wasn't a free trade, obviously, it was a managed trade, it was, it was industrial policy. It was, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna open up the tariffs, um, but there's gonna be rules around that. And not only was there the agreement, but as we know, um, there, was a, there was an undertaking by the, the automakers. So the Canadian government um, went to the automakers and, and um, got an agreement from them that they would fulfill certain production requirements and that that would increase over time as well. So again, it's, it's almost kind of hard to imagine maybe a deal like that now where you would, where you would get um, firms agreeing to this kind of thing, but, um, but certainly they did and, and it was in their interest. And, and let's not forget that these were American firms with Canadian subsidiaries. So um, the deal was structured like this. It was structured in, in the more detail that Andre described, but it really was uh, lowering of tariffs. So that part was the free trade part, but it really was an industrial policy. And um, um, and so one of so one of the things that I think is really important as as a, as a, a public policy um, someone who works in this space is I think evidence is important. And so what, what were the results? So let's look at the evidence. And I, I'd say here that the the evidence was mixed. It wasn't mixed um, from the numbers that Greg showed and, and some of the um, the numbers I, I have up here that. You know, there was a tremendous expansion. Um, it really worked in that sense. There's a, there's a sense in which it, uh, there's a slight caveat to that, which I'll explain in a minute. But, you know, we did get a guaranteed size of the market. We, one of the things, um, now we talk so much about global value chains, we didn't really talk about those back then, but, but that's what happened. We created these integrated, this integrated North American economy and, and um, in, all of the, in all of the work, it, it's parts and autos. So that did develop our, our global, our, 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 at least our North American value chains. Um, and to the extent that we could, we could import parts um, from around the world, global value chains. But th that kind of evolved and developed. Um, but it was a, a very big success in that sense. Um, so you can look at the numbers. Um, Greg did a good job of pre presenting the numbers. Tremendous expansion in, um, in production and employment and earnings. All of these things went in the right direction and they all went the way theory predicted they would go. Um, one, one slight concern, I'll just point this out. Um, a couple of people have mentioned uh, trade deficits already and, and um, I'm not gonna talk about trade deficits but I could give you a whole lecture on why we shouldn't talk about trade deficits but that does come up and it is a motivation. It's a motivation for Donald Trump um, and, it, and it can be a motivation for governments but it's not a good focus for, for trade policy especially uh, thinking about bilateral trade deficits and especially thinking about bilateral trade deficits in a particular industry. So I'll try not to go on a rant on, on trade deficits, but um, that, I won't put that as one of my criteria for a successful agreement, but what was successful was the expansion of production and that allowed us to go down the average cost curve. So Canada caught up to the Americans and actually surpassed it. The one caveat I would say, um, there's a really nice paper on this by um, by um, Melvin Fuss and, and Len, Len Waverman that looked at, the, that looked at really the, the sort of mechanism by which this was successful or not. And, um, and they did point out that there was these um, tremendous labor productivity improvements. We caught up to the Americans. Um, but what they pointed out was that we didn't get the competitiveness effect that you would get. 
And in a sense, it was, uh, you know, you still had an oligopoly, you still had a few small number of producers, but we did benefit from the expansion of the production. We benefited from being part of a, a North American industry that allowed us to expand production. But we didn't get the com competitiveness effect, which I'm going to talk about in a minute when I start talking about Paul Krugman's work. Okay, so, but overall, the auto pack was a great success. It, it, it did achieve what, um, what Tawana Cut and, and, and Bladen and other people had pointed out that it would achieve. And um, so in that sense, it was a great success. So the evidence, um, lots of studies on that, um, it did happen. Um, and so now I wanna shift gears and talk about what happened next. And the, um, the textbook theories on economics, um, um, in this case, uh, it's important to understand that what Wanaka did and, and other economists when they talked about uh, scale economies in this context, they were talking about one industry. And the economic models, the toolkits that economists had to understand impacts of, uh, uh, um, uh, on the economy weren't really weren't developed yet. And so Paul Krugman won a Nobel Prize. Uh, he got the, the 2008 Nobel Prize for the work he did. Um, and uh, I, I thought it was interesting today when Joe pointed out that um, Adam Smith's book was hundreds of 200 pages long. Um, Paul Krugman's um, mo most important writing was 10 pages long. This, this theory of monopolistic competition, it, it's a wonderful article. Um, and um, so Paul Krugman gets the Nobel Prize, but in, 19, in, in 1979 when he wrote this article, it did bring the sectoral idea of, of monopolistic competition for one industry to, you could do it in a general equili e equilibrium setting. And, um, Importantly, um, I, I thought it was interesting, if you look at the Nobel Prize Committee um, um, uh, comments on Krugman's work, he does, he does, they do mention the car industries, but they, they mention Sweden, but uh, that, that could be their own uh, geographical bias, but, but it was the car industry that was the example that they used. Um, this became known as new trade theory, but it wasn't about oligopolies, it was about monopolistic competition. So there's that piece that, that Fuss and Waverman talked about where they, where they said we didn't get the, comp the competitiveness part of that, we didn't get the entry of new firms, we didn't get the competition effect that you get in a monopolistically competitive environment. So um, Krugman wrote this, this um, right away uh, to, to uh, Canadian economists, uh, Rick Harris and, and David Cox, um, took Krugman's work and developed it into a computable general equilibrium model, which allowed them to model monopolistically competitive uh, firms in the whole Canadian manufacturing sector. And that work um, was, was, was really a sea change. It really did change the conversation. Their work went directly into one of the 72, was it, uh, uh, um, parts of the McDonald Commission, 70 or 72. Um, I think their, their, their contribution their book, you know, it made, that's from the, that's from the, the uh, recommendations and the conclusion of the, of the McDonald Commission report. I think it all became about what Harris and Cox showed, that there were tremendous gains from free trade. And again, probably you, you all know this, but if you, if you took a standard um, constant returns to scale economic model just based on comparative advantage, if you, if you plug that into a model, you got very small gains from trade. But when you, when you added the scale economies and the competitiveness effect of a monopolistically competitive um, industries, you get massive e effects. So uh, uh, Harrison Cox found almost 9% gains, 8.9% gains from Canada signing a free trade agreement. Again, um, it was theoretical, it was based on empirics, they, they had the, the general equilibrium model, but it was, uh, it really did change, it changed the minds of policymakers in Canada. And, and it came through the McDonald Commission report, and then we signed the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. So, in summary, um, the Wanakut's work was, it was important, it was, um, it was, uh, it was sectoral though, and, and the auto pack, um, I said earlier that it was protectionist, it was, it was industrial policy. Um, you know, two, two parts about that. One is that it was sectoral, and the other was that um, it, was, it, was, it, shut out the rest of the, it shut out the rest of the world in a sense. It, it, was, uh, it was a preferential arra arrangement. Um, but then the evidence was, was, was uh, gathered, and it was pretty clear that this was a major success, and it did deliver what we wanted. Um, but then, uh, instead of having a managed trade, 
the, the idea was let's liberalize trade, let's, let's do what we did in the auto sector across the board, and now we had the intellectual and uh, theoretical uh, backing for that from the work of Krugman and then Harrison Cox, and then applied um, and uh, brought home in the McDonald Commission report. So um, from the Nobel, from the textbook to the Nobel Prize to, uh, I, I know that the prize came later, but the work happened in 1979. And, uh, and Rick Harris and his colleague uh, really bringing this to the policy world and really changing the minds of policymakers. I was a I was a student at in, I was a student at Carleton University when the Canada U.S. Free Trade Agreement thing was unfolding. And so I, first I was reading the Wanakut stuff and trying to learn about that. And then Paul Krugman's work, um, kind of uh, you know as I say today, today, minds blown. Like our minds were blown. And Rick Harris comes along with his paper that really did make a change. Uh, it really did change the intellectual argument about free trade in Canada. And, uh, um, and that, that uh, so I think after lunch, we're gonna hear more about the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement.